Welcome back to History of Christianity. I hope everyone is doing well today. Last time we looked at the uh, teachers and the schools of the early church, and today we're going to continue our study and look at Constantine, who was the first uh, Christian emperor of the Roman Empire, and then the Roman Empire became a quote-unquote Christian empire. And uh, there, were made, there was a major impact on Christianity, first because persecution basically ended, uh, but then many people uh, because the emperor was a Christian, many people came into the church and brought a lot of things with them, a lot of baggage with them that the church would then have to deal with. So we're going to look at Constantine uh, today, and then we're going to continue our study today and look at monasticism, where some of the people didn't like what was going on in the church. Uh, they didn't like all the, the um, changes that were taking place, and so they decided to leave and leave society totally and head out into the wilderness and become... Uh, basically monks out in the wilderness. And that was the beginning of monasticism. And monasticism then spread around the empire itself. So we're going to be looking at that today. Stay tuned for the PowerPoint. Okay, class, we're going to have our PowerPoint portion of the lecture on Constantine and monasticism. As you see on the top of the screen there, Constantine, he was emperor of the Roman Empire. He, his uh, dates for his life are 272 to 337 A.D., and uh, just some pictures there of, uh, there was a statue of Constantine, who he was a great emperor, um, and they built a statue uh, called the Colossus of Constantine. And uh, it is in Rome today, or what is left of it. And so the, the head on the left is very um, famous um, part of the sculpture that you usually see when you um, think of Constantine. And uh, that head there is eight feet tall by itself. And then you see the rest of what is the left uh, um, remaining of the statue uh, there. It's in Rome, and the statue was over 40 feet tall of, uh, of Constantine. Okay, so Constantine's path to power. Um, we're not going to go into great detail of, of what was taking place because it's kind of it's it's difficult to follow in some some parts of this. But there was this type of a, uh, an odd, I'll say it's odd, uh, four emperor reorganization set up by Diocletian, Emperor Diocletian. And what he did was there was Diocletian and Max, uh, Maximina who were emperors or what, they, what we would call Augustuses. And they were kind of like the ones in control, one in the west, one in the east. And then under them, there was set up uh, these t this type of sub-emperor, which was uh, Galerius and Constantinus Chlorus. And they were called Caesars. Okay, so you have this, this kind of an odd four-emperor reorganization to rule the empire, split in different ways. Well, Diocletian became ill, and he decided to abdicate, which means give up the throne. And he went into retirement. And so Galerius, he came up and he took over. Now Constantine was the son of Constantius Chlorus, who was one of the sub-emperors. Now Constantine was a military leader, and he had a lot of strong support uh, from his, his soldiers. He was a very popular military leader, and, and the soldiers put their support behind him. And so what they did was they refused to obey Galerius, and they put forward Constantine as emperor. Galerius appealed to Diocletian. Okay, now remember, Diocletian was in retirement. He appeals to Diocletian, who appointed another Augustus, Licinius. Okay, so again, just follow along here with the story. Licinius is now being put forward as one of the emperors. So civil war was imminent. Um, and when that was about to take place, Galerius became ill and he died. And that was that was a, a time of that, that Constantine, Constantine could make his move. So Constantine he moved from Gaul against the other Augustuses and Caesars. Okay, and Gaul is what we would call France today. So he moved from there against these other guys. So on the eve of the battle, Constantine has a revelation and. He has the chi and the rho symbols placed 
on the their shields, on the soldiers' shields. Now, the kind the row is a Christian symbol. It's the, the symbol for Christ, and I have it there on the side of the screen there. The chi is the X, and the row, it looks like a P uh, there in the middle. So that's the chi and row. And actually, in this symbol, which is on a building in the Vatican in Rome, also has the alpha and the omega. So this is the Greek letter for alpha, that little upside down, almost like triangle thing. And then this thing that looks like a W, um, that's the omega. Okay, and, and so that would be um, representing Christ. Okay, so they're on the shields. Uh, what takes place is the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312 AD. Constantine's the winner. He has the victory, and he sets up his control of the western portion of the empire. So that's his path to power, and, uh, and, and he's going to make some really important changes uh, to the empire. Okay, so Rome and Constantinople. He gained strong loyalty of the citizens, and the way he did that was he focused his attack on the barbarians, which were on the borders of, of the Roman Empire. So that's going to be up on the fringes. And by focusing his attack there on the, uh, the barbarians and consolidating his power within the empire, he's offering protection to the citizens. And so the citizens, are, are they like this. Uh, we're protected. We have a strong emperor. And what he did, what Constantine did, was he challenged and he defeated any rival to him. And he did it one at a time. He was slow. He was methodical. He, he reigned for about 30 years. So he, he was slow and methodical, and he, he just defeated his enemies one at a time. After gaining power in the West... He decides he's going to uh, Constantine is going to consolidate his power and focus on the east. Now, at this time, the east was still under Licinius's control. Three fourteen, Constantine invaded and took Byzantium, which is in the west. Uh, excuse me, the eastern part of the empire. Three twenty two, Constantine invaded all of Licinius's remaining territory. Licinius ordered his soldiers not to look at the Christian symbol on the shields. And uh, they lost. Okay, and I wouldn't say it's because they not to look at the actual symbol itself, but um, they were distracted by this, and and they were just overpowered by Constantine, and they lost. Uh, Constantine then ruled the entire uh, empire uh, at this time, and he ruled for um, another thirteen years. Uh, he moved to a new Rome, and this new Rome built was called Constantinople, named after him, city of Constantine is what it means. It's still there today. Today it's called Istanbul. It's Istanbul, Turkey, uh, is what uh, Constant Constantinople was. And it's at a strategic crossroads uh, of Europe and Asia Minor. Okay, so Constantine, uh, pagan to Christian. So we're going to look now at Constantine's conversion. There is speculation if it was a, gen a genuine conversion. Okay, there really is. Uh, they're not, people say he's the first Christian emperor in the Christian empire, and, and people can argue that point, um, but there is, there is uh, speculation if he actually became a true Christian. Some say it was a true conversion, but he did not fully understand theology uh, behind Christianity. Uh, many people say what he did was he did this for a political advantage to have the support of Christians. Uh, Christians of the time were placed under strict discipline and instruction after conversion. So... When you think of Constantine as the emperor, he wasn't really put under any kind of strict discipline or instruction after his conversion. Uh, he did; he never had like a bishop or a teacher over him uh, to disciple him or to instruct him. He did place a bishop over his son Crispus, but he never really like a, a new Christian at that time would have would have strict discipline and and discipleship. But Constantine never had that. Uh, he reserved the right to set his own religious practices. And then baptism, obviously baptism is very important. Uh, baptism at that time was extremely important. Basically, if you weren't baptized, you weren't even looked at as a Christian. Uh, he wasn't even baptized until he was on his deathbed. He shifted worship of the sun, the actual sun in the sky. He shifted that to worshiping of God um, however, this shift, it was kind of a convoluted shift. There were still other false gods within the empire, and and it was just kind of a, there was a shift to the true god, but um, it was, don't, don't think that every pagan god was gone. 
And he he is the one that took the title of Supreme Pontiff, which is like high priest. So this is his conversion. Uh, the impact of his conversion uh, at the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, and that's a, that's a well-known date, the Edict of Milan 313 AD, uh, persecution of the church stopped. And there was a development of official theology, but also there was also false theologies that began to develop. Uh, for example, Arianism, which we will look at next time. Christians also came together uh, to worship God. So this idea of the persecuted church who were meeting, you know, meeting underground, meeting in houses, and uh, in fear of the government, well, now their persecution had ended. So Christians began to um, come together and meet together, and uh, you're going to start having um, churches, uh, church meeting places built, which would then turn into the cathedrals. Uh, but many people flocked to the church, and also many people flocked to the church that were not Christians. Okay, so that would lead to apostasy. Again, if you have a Christian emperor, and he's all behind Christianity, many people think it's advantageous for them to become Christians, quote-unquote, to uh, please the government, please the emperor, whatever it may be. Well, many of them were not true Christians, and they came into the church saying that they were true Christians, and they brought apostasy. Okay, and then uh, the third impact was, so we have the Edom of Milan, the Christians gathering together to worship, and then the third impact is uh, the exodus to monasticism. Again, we'll get to that here just in a second. But many people did not like what was going on in the church through apostasy and other uh, beliefs that were coming in, and so they decided to leave and become monastic, which is like a monastery, or go off themselves like a monk. And the beginning of monasticism was under the Desert Fathers. Continuing the impact, uh, imperial protocols began to influence worship. So, you know, the burning of incense for the emperor, uh, which might not have been like, well, I'm worshiping the emperor, but definitely it came into worship uh, that... Um, as we come in to worship the Lord, we'll also burn some incense for the emperor. So it's kind of an imperial protocol came in. Priests began to wear luxurious robes. Uh, processionals and choirs were used, uh, especially when the emperor entered the church. So this, these imperial protocols began to influence worship. And next thing you know, you start having um, the priests in robes and processionals for the priests coming in and... And this whole um, change, basically, of how the church was done, when the church used to meet in homes, now it's in this, this grand setting. Uh, relics began to appear. Uh, relics are um, artifacts uh, that, that were given religious um, meaning, and then they began to do things, such as miracles and all of that. So um, bones of martyrs were unearthed and became relics. Um, some of them were buried under the altars of the church in churches that were being built to give them kind of a special meaning, uh, even a special power, so that if someone came to this church, maybe a miracle would happen. Uh, Christian artifacts began appearing all over the empire, and it was said to have miraculous powers. Uh, even Constantine's mother said she had found the cross of Christ. So it's just, and, and this got crazy. Um, as, as time went on, relics across the empire, even into the Middle Ages and even up towards the Reformation, where you know there was enough pieces of the cross found that you could probably have a you know a, a, a hundred crosses. I mean, it was just pieces of wood that they said was the cross of Christ. I mean, it was just got it got really insane. Uh, basilicas, the last one here uh, on the screen, basilicas were built which uh, is a church building that is made up in three parts. This is what you would think of with the cathedral. Uh, there is an atrium, a nave, and a sanctuary. These uh, basilicas were richly adorned. Again, thinking of the beginning of the early church, of how the early church in the book of Acts was, compared to here in the 4th century, You know, you, now you have richly adorned, big cathedral-style buildings, uh, an atrium had a fountain for ritual washing. 
the floor plan was of a T shape or a cross shape, which I have a picture coming up of that. Uh, there was a chair for the bishop. And this is where we get our word cathedral. The chair was called cathedra. That was the name of the chair, the cathedra. And that's where we get our word cathedral. And that was for the bishop, so prominent place for, for him to sit. Uh, there were mosaics. There was artwork. There were statues. A lot of things placed in the, uh, in the basilicas to decorate it and adorn it. There was a large baptistry that could hold a, a dozen people at a time. Um, and that was for baptisms that would be through immersion or pouring. So early on like this, um, don't, think, don't think immediately the Catholic Church with like sprinkling a baby or christening a baby or anything like that. There were still baptisms taking place in a large pool baptistry in the front of the, of the cathedral or of the basilica. Okay, here's St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This is where the, the, the Pope presides. And you can see how large it is. These are, these are people. So down here is people. You can see them walking up here, the steps. So just, just massive, massive building uh, that was built. Again, compared to the early church who were meeting in a humble house, maybe in one room, to, to this uh, site here. Okay, the picture that I just showed you. So this, see, look, look at this dome here. There, there's the dome of St. Peter's. Okay, so here's the same dome right here. Okay, so this is a panoramic of the of the complex. Okay, this is all St. Peter's leading up to it. I mean, just massive. This is inside St. Peter's, so richly adorned. You can just see all, all the decoration and splendor. And then here's a diagram of a basilica in this shape of a cross. So you come in here, and this is the nave. That's where, you know, you basically you would be sitting, uh, aisles. This, so this is where the people would be sitting. And then you have the choir up here. Okay, and that's like the, the cross piece of the cross. And then up here is the apse, or this would be like where the altar is up here. So that's, uh, that's a basilica. Okay, so we'll come back to Constantine because he's going to be involved in some of the controversies coming up in the church. And he's going to be involved in solving some of the controversies. Uh, but now we're going to just shift gears a little bit uh, to monasticism. Introduction, not everyone was pleased with the direction of the church. Uh, again, like I said, apostasy was coming in. Uh, people that weren't saved were saying they were part of the church, saying they were Christians. And Christians were not delving deep in worship or living a devout Christian life. When, Especially when people come in. Uh, maybe the upper class coming in who are not believers and they're richly adorned and they want to come into this this uh, basilica and you know basically more of a show for themselves instead of true worship. Uh, there were bishops that were competing for positions and living luxurious lives. The powerful seemed to dominate the church, and so uh, and also um, po politics, political power coming into the church. Uh, the church aligning with a, a, a politician or some sort of political movement. So some people just did not like what was going on in the church. And the response was monastic life. Let's flee from society. Let's flee from the, the church, um, per se, there in Rome or wherever it is in the city, and flee and leave all of that behind, leave everything behind. And we are going to go out into the wilderness fleeing society, and we're going to dominate the body and its passions. We are going to get down to the basics of life to worship God and beat the body and its passions. So the origins of monasticism. Okay, there's a couple things to look at here. First, biblical. Um, people said, well, Paul talks about um, leading a celibate life. And, and that became a, a prime marker of the monastic life, was celibacy. So biblically, they were inspired by Paul's words, for those that choose not to marry, they can have great freedom in the Lord. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, that's where that's at. So the monk who doesn't marry, or later on the nun, because there, is going to be some, there are going to be some women um, monastic movements, 
who don't marry, they have great freedom in the Lord to worship the Lord and, and serve the Lord in that way. And so they would go into a life of, of in a monastery or a monastic life. There is a philosophical belief uh, that the soul was imprisoned in the body, and by limiting the body, you could actually free the soul. So that's a philosophical belief, belief, but that came into it, this idea of if we can hinder our, our passions, our flesh, uh, it will help us um, for, be free. Uh, there was a Stoic doctrine where passion was the enemy to wisdom. And so if you go out into a celibate life in isolation, you can have more wisdom. You'll be more wise because you are limiting your passions, let's say, in the evil, sin-filled city. If you're out away from all that, your, um, your passion is limited, and so you'll have more wisdom. So those are some origins, just beliefs uh, for monasticism. And the very beginning of it is what we call the desert monks. These were the very first monks in monasticism. Monk comes from the, the Greek word monakos, which means solitary. That word monakos means solitary. And we get the word monk. So they escaped the distra distraction of the cities and social interaction by escaping to the desert, which this was mainly in Egypt. Um, you couldn't get any more desert than Egypt, and so that's where they went. They went to Egypt. The early monks believed that the desert uh, was safe because of his, it being inaccessible. And that obviously uh, did not come to uh, fruition because some of the monks began getting a following and people followed them into the desert to be with them. So it wasn't so much that it was inaccessible, even though there was a thought of it. The movement is attributed to Paul the monk. At the end of the third century, he escaped persecution by fleeing into the desert he found an abandoned bandit's hideout, and he lived alone the rest of his life. He spent his days in prayer and contemplation, and he survived by eating dates, you know, the, kind of like a, uh, a fig, uh, eating dates. Uh, he only had one visitor while he was out there, and that was Anthony, who we're going to talk about next. Okay, so that's, it's attributed to the beginning, the beginning of the movement, it contributed, attributed, excuse me, attributed to Paul the monk. Anthony, born near the Nile River, his parents died, leaving the young boy and his sister enough to live comfortably. After hearing the story of the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, he decided to dispose of all of his property. He provided money for his sisters, and he left her with some virgins of the church. There were women in the church that served in the church, and he left his sister with them, and he decided to go out into the desert. Okay, and here's a, some artwork of Anthony the Great in the desert. So the imagery here, you can see he's, he's looking toward, over here, he's looking toward the isolation of the desert, of the mountains, of the, the wilderness over here where I'm circling. And he's got his hand up, kind of, no, I'm not going to be part of this civilization uh, over here. All right, so just continue on with the desert monks. Many monks followed to learn from those that went before them. They spent their days in small groups in solitude, learning, praying, meditating, cooking, tending small gardens. So they were out there in the wilderness kind of collecting together. This grew into communal monasticism. Okay, so a, a guy, a monk called Pacomagus, he lived with a monk for seven years inside of a large enclosure that he had built with his brother. But this gained a following, and he would not turn these... these They were, they were men that would go with men. Uh, they He would not turn these men away. The small group would pray, they sang, they meditated, they sat in silence, um, they delved into crafts and the basket weaving with the reeds that they found by the river... You know, so they, they did these activities of what we would think of with early monasticism, which would then go into a formal monastic life later on, once we get into the Middle Ages, where you start thinking of monasteries in Europe with the monks, with the hoods, and not talking to one another, those kind of activities. Well, this is early monasticism where they began to come together. Developed a monastic community with a hierarchy, so there would be a monk in charge. Usually the founder of the group would be in charge. 
And then over time, women would gather, and this also developed into women's communities where you would have um, women's monasticism, which would develop into the idea of the convent with the nun. The spread of monasticism. Uh, visitors to Egypt brought back news of monks living in the desert. The movement grew. Leaders of the church, the actual established church, let's say in the cities, saw benefit of this class of dedicated followers. And so the idea spread and the spread within the church also. Contributors to the spread were first off Jerome, which we will talk about. We have a whole lecture on Jerome. Uh, Jerome, he wrote Life of Paul the Hermit. Uh, Jerome became a monk, but later on he was more known for his theology than his monastic life. So that's Jerome. We have Basil of Caesarea. He founded a, a monastery and many monks would come to him for answers to theological questions. So he became very well known, Basil. And then Augustine of Hippo, again we have another uh, whole lecture just on him. Augustine of Hippo, which Hippo is in Egypt, uh, before his active role in the church as a theologian, he did live as a monk. And we think of Augustine, we think of theology, uh, but he did live as a monk also. So we see mon uh, monasticism spreading. We get to Martin of Tours. Here's another famous guy. His father forced him into the Roman army. When his unit entered Amiens, which is in France, he saw a half-naked, shivering beggar. And so Martin took off his cloak, cut the cloak in half, and wrapped the beggar in half of the cloak. Later, he had a vision, and Jesus came to him in this vision, and Jesus was wearing half the cloak. So this is the idea that, you know, what you do for the poor, you are actually doing for Jesus. So um, this is this vision that he had. After the army, Martin settled in Tours and became a monk. And later he was elected Bishop of Tours. He was uncomfortable with life that revolved around the cathedral as a bishop. And so he, that, oh, that's a type, typographical error that L loved. <laughs> he moved. It's supposed, that's supposed to say moved. I'm sorry about that. So he moved into a small cell that he built next to the cathedral. But even that was still too comfortable for him. He was uncomfortable with that. And he moved on the outskirts of the town. And he lived in a small hut on the outskirts of the town. And that is where he ministered from. So that's Martin of Tours. There's a side note here I found very interesting. We get the word chapel from this story. The Latin capella means cloak. And for centuries, a half a piece of cloak would hang in small churches. And these churches became known as chapels because of this piece of cloth that would hang in, in the church. And so they were called chapels. And it was to commemorate Martin's act to the beggar. And the leaders of these small churches were known as chaplains. So that's how we, we got that word, uh, basically from Martin of Tours, and then obviously the leaders being chaplains. I just thought that interesting. Uh, movement started in the desert for solace, and it ended spreading across Europe with a focus on charity and mission work. So here's a picture on the left, St. Martin renouncing uh, the army. So this here will be uh, the military, kind of a look at the military, flags, you have the standards, the tents, some leaders. And he's like, no, I'm leaving, and I'm going to go off. So he has the cross over here in his hand. And that was painted by Simone Martini, 1284 to 1344, so the Middle Ages is when this artwork was made. And then St. Martin the Beggar by Anthony Van Dyke. Van Dyke is a very well-known Renaissance painter, a little bit uh, after the Renaissance time period. But um, Anthony Van Dyke, and so you see, that, I mean, just looking at this painting, you can see the Renaissance influence there. So uh, this is uh, Martin of Tours up here on his horse. He's, cu he's cutting his cloak, and the beggar is down here. So just some really interesting artwork of uh, St. Martin. And, and that's it for this uh, PowerPoint. I'll see you in a second. Okay, class, that's it for today. Next time, we're going to be looking at some controversies that entered into the church. We'll be looking at Donatism and Arianism 
and then we'll be looking at the Council of Nicaea, which brought solutions uh, for those problems. We'll be looking at that next time. I hope everyone has a great day. See you next time.